Boys and Men. <laughs> awesome. Hey, welcome to the podcast. This is Darian, and I have a really special guest I've been waiting for for a while. My friend Tracy G. What's Yo. up, Tracy? Hey, Darren. How's it going? Why don't you tell people a little bit about uh, who you've played with and where you're coming from? Um, I've played with uh, quite a few people over the years. Some people known, a lot of people unknown. Just tons of various musicians, as musicians do. I guess we go through all types of different people to play with. But um, right. your Ronnie Dio is obviously the most known. That yeah, that's where, that's where met. I met you. Right. And uh, doing six years with him and three albums. One was a live album. And before that, were you in were you in World War Three coming out of that in yeah. the deal? Okay. Yeah, that 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 started it because I was uh I was in that about I think I, I joined up about ninety ninety. Yeah. Were you 90. in who was in that but were you playing with Mickey D in that band? Well a, a few people went through that uh, a few people went through that band. Um the singer Mandy Lyon had uh lineups way before me. Like right. he, he had you know, he did the Hollywood circuit like in the eighties. And um, I had heard of the band, and he'd done all that. And then um, I joined up with him, and we got this deal um, on Hollywood Records. Oh, it was like yeah. 1990. It was Band um, Graveyard. Um, um, owned by Disney. <laughs> so we thought, yeah, you know, totally. Three Musketeers and then World War Three. <laughs> They're like one right. of the first metal bands they signed, actually. They signed wow. a bunch of, a slew of bands that year, and they were trying to, they got a new, uh, um, I guess, What's it called? Like a the president of the label, um, uh, Mandy's manager knew him. Don Arden is Sharon Osbourne's right. father. Wow! So he he knew Peter Paterno, and Peter they hired Peter to be the president of Hollywood Records. So that got us our showcase, and we showcased me and Mandy and my ex rhythm section at the time. We showcased. They liked it, but they wanted us to get. Um, a m- more known or, or more of a um, more cali- caliber draw. rhythm section. So right. um, it was me and Mandy, the label's interested, the manager's interested. Mandy was great at what he did. He's crazy. You know, he, Mandy had the whole look thing with the hat and the cape and the voice and all that thing. But he really didn't have uh, songs built around him, like like riffs. And, you know, they, he didn't really have the song, so he never really got a deal. But when I came in and I gave him, you know, gave him the songs I had and stuff like that, then um, it connected with what he did and he had the grooves and the riffs behind him and they turned it into better, you know, metal songs at least. So the management said, yeah, you know, so now we need is a rhythm section. So here comes uh, um, Jimmy Bain. Oh, you know, right. So somebody, somebody, um, um, my friend Jim. His name was Jim Marino at the time. He he was he goes out a lot and stuff, and he, he was hanging out to Troubadour. And he goes, uh, he tells us, yeah, I, I I seen Jimmy Bain at the bar last night. I got his phone number for you guys because I know you guys need a you know bass player, whatever. And I go, Jimmy that's cool. Jimmy yeah. Bain. I know. That's I go good. what? You know, I mean, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Right? I grew up on I'm that guy. Long, back from uh, long story short, right? Rainbow days. Right. And stuff you know, like. come on. You know, I'm like, oh my god, do do we have to audition him? I mean, he, <laughs> but you know, um, we we met him. True story. We met him. Uh, me and Mandy met him at a. El Compadre, right across from right. the Guitar Center. Totally. Great Mexican food, right? We know. And uh, we met him there in my little white truck. It was raining. We parked my truck in the um, Guitar Center parking lot across the street because it was raining, I remember. And there I am. And we'd already demoed. I had a little Tascam um, four track cassette yeah. studio. They had just come out. So that's what uh, my music was demoed and Mandy's voice was demoed. So we we talked to Jimmy, met Jimmy. Um, Jimmy was open for it. We walked across the street. We all three got in my truck, and um, so it was all rainy, and, and we put the cassette in. It all <laughs> sounded cool, shitty dude. and distorted or whatever. Right. We put it in there, and uh, I'll never forget because I was like me, and then Jimmy was in the middle, and Mandy's over there. And me and Mandy were like, it's fucking Jimmy Bain, dude. I, know. I mean, you it's know. It's like surreal, huh? Yeah. And there. then we the play him our songs, like a couple songs, and he's like, in his uh, Scottish accent right. or whatever, you know. <laughs> oh, I'd love to audition for you guys, you know. And this is fucking it's making my hands sweat. It's so heavy. Killer. Or like fuck. So you know, we came down and he came down, whatever, and pra- jammed with us, and it was an instant fit with that kind of stuff we were doing, and just right. perfect, just solid. Then uh, we still need a drummer. Mandy found another drummer. He's kind of a speed metal guy. Um, I don't think he fitted really good, but he was, you know, good enough. So we the label took us into like a bigger studio called Cornerstone Studio. Yeah, uh, yeah you I heard of that? that place. We went in there. 
I try to get my memory bank in. Uh, this is 1989, 90. Yeah, 90. And uh, then we were recording... We're demoing the tracks um, with Jimmy Bain and uh, Cam was his name, this other drummer, and me and Mandy. And then uh, the label comes down and says, you know, we, uh, W-E-A, they're like the yeah, you Warner know, Electra, so distributors, know right? A big time Atlantic. distributors. They, they, uh, um, they love what they heard, a few songs that we heard. Um, Bill Montour, Montour, Mont- Little, Bill Matoyer. Is that right? it? Yeah, is that yeah. it? Yeah, he from Metal Blade now. He's a, yeah, yeah. He he uh, he produced that little demo or whatever it was, and um, I did Over the Rainbow on it, a part of it. Um, out of everything we recorded, he just kept we just kept Over the Rainbow. That ended up on the actual World War Three album. That oh, right. that's from if you see it, it'll say Bill's name on it because he recorded that. Right. It's just a little piece of it. It's like a little Hendrix kind of, you know, sound sure. effect. Yeah. Sure. And it ties in with uh, Richie Blackmore and, and Jimmy Bain kind of thing. I, I guess. You, got, you, made, I, I, you had like a little musical of, tie-in. Sort of, yeah. That's Rainbow, cool. hey, over the rainbow. And then, you know, you're exactly. And Jimmy Bain, yeah. Wea goes, uh, this group is going to be really good. We don't want them to just make an EP. We want a whole record. But the drummer had a little bit of a timing timing problem, so you guys need to hire like a real studio killer cat that can bang this shit out right. without no flaw. So uh, we were a little bit sad because Cam was, you know, a friend and he was in the band. But what we're going to do, right? We got it. Now we got to, they're telling us to move on. We got to hire. So me and Mandy both looked at Jimmy and goes, where the fuck is Vinny, right? Right. Because right. we knew their connection. And I love Vinny's playing. Who doesn't? And, and Mandy did too. And and then uh, so Jimmy took the demo to Vinny. Vinny heard it and said, you know, this is heavy shit. Let's go. And so Vinny, Dude, awesome. Vinny's on the album because of that. Wow. And he did the tour too. He just ended up staying. And was he still in Dio at that time? No, he was out, and Jimmy was out of both. They were oh, okay. both out of Dio, so it was just meant to be like it was a perfect timing. Cool. So I find myself playing with Dio's rhythm section, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm like over the, you know, I'm like because these songs, these riffs I gave Mandy, I, I actually had them in two or three groups back in '87, '88, '89. I had these riffs and. They were going through different singers, you know, trying to make them something, right? But the riffs were the riffs. Now they gave them to Mandy. He did what he did on them. And now the rhythm section is these guys. So they sounded like, they sound like they're supposed to sound now, right? That's so cool. I'm like pretty happy at that point. I'm like, because it's all about the music, you know, finally. And then and then we did the album and, and all that. And then I did one tour and um, did some cool shows. Um, and then after the tour... Vinny gets asked to go do Dehumanizer with Ronnie Dio and Sabbath. Oh, so there yeah, goes Vinny. Okay. That's what, all right. There goes Vinny. Right. And then uh, we're left with, and Jimmy was uh, busy on the hill with uh, CC DeVille, I think, at oh, that time, from what I hear. He was like out of the picture <laughs> too. So me and Manny, so we just start uh, demoing stuff. And um, to back up a little bit, when Vinny left, we had to get another drummer to do some gigs. And that's where Mickey D came in. And oh, did cool. and did a couple of gigs um, with us at the Roxy, but he was in Motorhead already. He, oh, he already yeah, was. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. He just kind of. I, I never thought he was going to be in in World War Three personally because he was in Motorhead. He was just kind of doing a little off things Side for thing, us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And uh, he, he's just you know phenomenal. We wrote a couple yeah, songs killer. with him. Killer drummer. Cool, cool personality. Great too. guy. Funny, yeah. Fun guy. Yeah, and just Sweden, right from Sweden. Funny guy, great drummer, little little guy, right? Yeah. I used to say- big, like, he Little remi- guy, big hair. Yeah, big hair. He <laughs> remind me of, uh, he always looked like Al Pacino and Scarface to me. If you just look at his face, I always would tease yeah, him. And he'd me. go, yeah, some people say that. you know. But um, he came in, did some great, uh, we tried out like Simon Wright and wow. all, these, all these drummers to fill Vinny's place, you know? That's where I met Ray Luzera. He was one of the drummers okay. trying out too, like this young nineteen-year-old kid just ripping. You know the guy in Corn. You know what I'm talking about. Right, 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 yeah. Now he's cool. in Corn, but Ray. That's how I met Ray. Is he auditioned for World War Three, right? But Mickey got the gig because Mickey was Mickey, and you know he 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 knew all the. He was a little bit more experienced than Ray at the time and all that stuff. So Mickey did it. We did only a couple gigs with him, and then um, pretty soon um, it's left with just me and Mandy. We're we're demoing songs. We lose the management. We lose everything. We're just no 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 deal. Just by ourselves, and uh, we start to demo more songs, and then it went bad, you know. Singer, singer, guitar player, butt heads, and you know, it gets <laughs> stupid, whatever. I don't want to get into all that negative shit, but it just got stupid. So we split, and then um, I start another band, and I'm thinking, you know, how am I going to surpass that? You know, like, right. yeah, like, 
whatever. So I start, you know, some local guys, I start playing, and then I get a call from Vinny saying, um, you want to try out for Dio? You wow. Know? And dude. I'm like, uh, must have been like let whoa. me check my calendar. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> huh? You know, so there I go and in my little white propane truck again. <laughs> yeah. By myself, and there's Vinny, and there's Jimmy, which is my old rhythm section. Right. And, and you Ron- were already comfortable but playing But no, no, no Mandy. Now it's Ronnie Dio instead of Mandy. Yeah. So I'm like, hello. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, are you kidding me? Like, it was just almost like, fuck, you know? Because up to that point, I was about 30 years old then. Up to that point, nothing really went that great with music. I mean, I did all the parties, and I did all the gigs, and I did all the local stuff like everybody does, and paid the dues and everything. But it was just kind of professionally like not going really great i mean it was but i was playing and learning but no deals and no tours and no real shit like that until until the Vinny and jimmy you know experience and then from there they told ronnie um listen to this world war three album and later ronnie told me he heard it and he fucking hated it <laughs> he goes like, fuck it he goes awesome. tracy i know you're my guitar player now but he goes i gotta tell you that singer was so fucked up. I couldn't even. I couldn't even get. <laughs> yeah, this is Ronnie ra- talking. Radical different style. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. And I go, yeah, I know. Not it's not a cup. You know, it's not everybody's cup of tea. But and he didn't even really listen. He he thought my guitar playing was just because I'm into making a lot of sounds and a lot of noise right, and right, a lot of totally. and, right. And he he's like, I, I he didn't he didn't he really wasn't get sure it. How it was gonna he fit. didn't get it. He didn't yeah. really get it. But he had me come down and play with with Vinny and Jimmy. And the thing was, is I'd already toured with them, so. When I walk into the room with them, it was you're, like we already a band. You're yeah, already, I'm comfortable, yeah, and so. they're comfortable. So Ronnie almost couldn't deny it. Right, he almost couldn't deny. He just kind of went because he had the world to pick. I mean, any, any guitar player in the world almost would want to play, get that gig. I mean, almost. Yeah, sure. I would say. But any, a big or, part of the getting that, the big part of picking somebody like that is is the uh, chemistry with the whole you're band. You're a million percent right, dude. I mean. I mean, and you can get somebody that totally shreds, but if well, he's like well, listen causing to this. problems in the band, it's like listen nobody to wants this. to play with him. This guy wasn't a problem, but here's a good example. Like Vinny Moore came the day before me. Oh wow. I mean, fuck, man. That guy's that guy amazing. Shreds. Yeah, he's I killer. mean, I could never play the shit but, that guy. I mean, but, I don't know. He wouldn't be the right fit for that band. But listen, I go, I go, I go, Vinny, like after I got the gig and I, we were talking about shit, I go, what the fuck was wrong with him? I mean, he's he's amazing. He goes, you know what? We couldn't hear him. I go, what? Because we could, we had a town to turn up like four times. We couldn't hear him. Wow! I go, wow! Are you I wonder kidding if he me? Like, like, I wonder if he felt like self conscious. I don't know. I go, that <laughs> guy's, you know, he's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, again, it's not always just about you're the best looking guy. You're the best shredder. You're the. It's it's like you said. It it just has to be right. It has to feel right, and the chemistry has to. Feel right, and me and Vinny and Jimmy musically, we'd already made music. I mean, we'd oh, so when we locked into a groove, like I played no deal songs ever to the for their audition. It was just oh, really? jamming. Wow. No, because everybody thinks, you know, what deal songs did you have to play? Yeah, did that's did what you I have figured. to play the solos right and all that? No, he wanted a new guy that could write new shit for him, and that's exactly what I did on that first album. Right, yeah. right. He wanted and, and a new sound, album, basically. He wanted a new sound. He was in experimental mode, I think. I think he just wanted a he just wanted to try something new. He wanted to write different things with his lyrics. He, he he changed a little on the lyrics. He didn't do the rainbows and stuff so much. He went more about like politicians and uh Oh really? Wow. Yeah, the lyrics on the first album, um but Angry Machines that came later that started to kinda come back a get little bit. weird and they were they were kinda like um Strange Highway's better and it has more of a flow because he just said, this guy, Tracy, is my guitar player. He's my rhythm section. Let's just play music. And we did. And we just I just brought in riffs that I had. I mean, it just flowed. Awesome. And there was nobody thinking, nobody saying this. this. And then when Angry Machines came in, all the brains got in the way and the record second companies guessing. changed. Second guessing. And, yeah. and you hear that, unfortunately. I, mean, I think there's still some great shit on there, but you, you, you hear the tension, the right. ungood tension, you know. Um, but that's, that's the way it goes, man. You know... Um, there's a lot to cover with you because you've had a, a lot of stuff going on in your career, but let, let's get to some stories because I want to come back to that. Okay. We'll start with something kind of light. <laughs> this is all; These are all just crazy random stories you'll hear. So uh, here's the first one. Detroit EMT suffers heart attack on the job. Imagine if you started having a heart attack at work, you'd probably drop everything to get medical care. But for Detroit EMT Joseph Hardman, that wasn't an option. 
Arbin and his partner were in the middle of treating and transporting a patient who was having a serious heart attack when Hardman began experiencing symptoms of his own. Wow. <laughs> I didn't need a machine to tell me I was having a heart attack, said Hardman, because all the symptoms are present with the heart attack. I was pretty much having them all. Can you imagine? (laughs) It's your job to help people when you're having heart attacks and and you start start having one. one. That's insane. That's totally insane. That's crazy, dude. That's kind of like almost ironic. Like like, like you think like, "Is is is this a joke? Is this really happening? Well, here's the crazy part. He goes, Despite his own distress, a 40-year-old EMT finished caring for his patient. Hardman warned his partner, who was driving, that there'd be two patients instead of one when they <laughs> arrived at DMC Hartford oh, University sh- Hospital. Oh. That's pretty heavy. Wow. I mean, how how solid is it for the guy to just troop on and fi- and help the other dude, help the patient, ah, while he's the, having a heart attack? That's, a, that's crazy. Yeah. Where do you find this story at? On the internet, it's still insane, dude. I mean, it's I totally. Do, sometimes insane. I see some of your. Sometimes I see a couple of your posts, and and they are kind of like that. Now that I think they're like Here's you say. A, well, check I gotta this try out. to save the good ones. Some you weird know? shit. You <laughs> save some, the good ones for the show. Where's this guy find this weird check, shit? Check dude. this out. Lodi police officer shot when child pulled trigger on his gun at reading event. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> A Lodi police SWAT officer had a Glock 35 and a flashlight in a sty holster at a children's reading event when a boy managed to pull the trigger and shoot the officer. <laughs> How do you manage it? I mean, you probably want to have a, a gun with a safety on it if you're going to hang out with the little children. Actually, do you even want to have a gun if you're going to be in a room with little kids? I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, you should. I it know. doesn't have an external safety or anything like that. The gun <laughs> functioned how it was supposed to. When the trigger is pulled, the gun went off, said Lieutenant Lucia. Did it shoot? That's did awesome. it shoot the guy? Yeah, he was shot. Oh, man. I wonder where he shot in the leg or something. The bullet hit the officer's leg. He was taken to a hospital for a minor injury and released. <laughs> a small child, witnesses say he was six to eight years old, was able to walk up to the officer and pull the trigger. <laughs> I mean, that is, talk about being. That's insane. Yeah. I think you'd feel like a fool. Five year old shoots you <laughs> <laughs> with your own gun. It's insane. Yeah, you find some trippy stuff, dude. I got a real good one for you. Swedish men warned of crotch chomping fish. So they can't go in the can't go in the river, or whatever. Because you better tell Mickey about this. Swedish men has been have been warned <laughs> have been warned to keep their swimwear on while bathing in Orison Sound off the southern coast of Sweden. I probably wrecked that pronunciation. After a relative of the piranha was discovered in the area, that's insane. Ever since a fisherman reeled in a twenty-one centimeter paku at the Orison Sound off uh, southern Sweden, experts have been on alert. The fish species. A relative to the notorious piranha caused the museum staff in nearby Denmark to put out a warning. Keep your swimwear on if you're bathing in the sound these days. <laughs> <laughs> the fish, the, the crazy thing about the way they phrase this, you probably, you might have heard about the stories. It, it happened a while ago, but it said the paku is not normally dangerous to people, but it has quite a serious bite. There have been incidents in other countries, such as Papua New Guinea, where some men have had their testicles bitten off. What? Yeah, that's not good. Wow. While Carl said the museum's warning about the Paku, sometimes known as ball cutter, was meant (laughs) as a bit of fun. Human (laughs) victims of the Paku are rarely laughing. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah, that is not, that's, that's not happening. That's a painful subject. Of course, it, it usually eats nuts, fruit, and small fish, but human testicles are just a natural <laughs> target. <laughs> oh, man. That is, definitely send a memo to Mickey immediately. Yeah. That wouldn't be good. Those are supposed to be in Sweden? Yeah. Is that what they said? <laughs> they found them in Sweden. Fuck. Not good. Here's a bad story. You know, I said, you know, start with something light. This is where it goes bad right here. (laughs) Green Acres man accused of decapitating roommate and tells cops things got a little carried away. Like what in the hell possesses these people? Check check this out. (laughs) A little carried away. Gerard Longo once described Scott Tobison as a violent man who brags about his fighting ability and just how bad he is. And he owns knives, axes, machetes, and switchblades. He sharpens knives as a hobby. (laughs) um, Oh, oh no. (laughs) Yeah. 
And he got he actually this dude got a restraining order against him. For some reason they ended up roommates. And uh Tobias in forty nine is in Palm Beach County Jail accused of killing Longo forty eight and then removing his head and limbs from his torso. <sighs> Green Acres police were first notified of Longo's murder Tuesday night. Tobison then told his girlfriend and he told her not to tell anyone. And then <laughs> she called the police and they spotted a man with blood on his shoes holding what appeared to be a tote bag in his hands. Detectives would later find out a gruesome discovery. Longo's legs in a plastic bag, his head and arms in the tote. Police <laughs> interviewed him and he... <laughs> oh, fuck. This is not really... Funny, but it's uh, for some reason I'm laughing because when he, when they interviewed him, because it's over the top. He said dude. things just got a little carried away. That's in the affidavit. Like, how, how do just, you go there? How do you just like go cross the line like that? Yeah, that's just a little carried away. Yeah. I think he's. I think this guy's just totally. Oh man, there's some people out there. I don't know. I think that guy is. Uh, you know, where was this at? Did you say where time. this was at? Where was Palm that? Beach, oh. Florida. Oh. All well, these stories are from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go visit Florida. This is an old one, but it's pretty crazy. I, for some reason, it caught my attention. Man killed himself with giant souvenir pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Coroner baffled by bizarre death. A window cleaner died after stabbing himself in the groin repeatedly with a jumbo souvenir pencil. An inquest heard. <laughs> Jeffrey Burton's family and friends were baffled by his bizarre death which was recorded as an open verdict because there's no evidence he was trying to commit suicide. I don't, I, I don't get it. What was he trying to do then? <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is uh, when police broke into his house, they find Mr. Burton lying on his back wearing only underpants. <laughs> the room was splattered with blood and music was still playing on the stereo. I wonder what the music was. A giant blood covered pencil was beside him and he had a deep gash on his upper thigh. I mean, makes me think about those pencils you get at like at Knott's Berry Farm and stuff. <laughs> totally. Right? I know. Oh, that's what I was a big old pencil, yeah. East Sussex Corner, Adam Cray said, uh, told the Hastings Inquest, it's a mystery to me. If you were choosing to take your own life, that's not the way you would do it. <laughs> I don't get it. <sighs> Whack. And then he says, it seems to me it can't have been a single stab wound. He seemed to have worked on it. The pencil was blunt. So, I mean, <laughs> Should have been sharp. Wouldn't that be pretty painful? Oh. <laughs> Here's back to wacky stuff. A little mellower. <laughs> that was a little gnarly. We got really gnarly really quick. <laughs> have, have, having trouble with your aim? Chinese contraption helps you pee straight. So apparently, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently what? China. I don't what? know. I don't know what's going on, but uh, they're they're trying to find people that like. Piss all over the toilet, I guess, or whatever public toilets. Yeah, because I I guess it's a big problem in China. <laughs> <laughs> and so an uh. an entrepreneur in southern city of Shenzhen has unveiled a contraption designed to help those who miss the mark at the urinal. The P straight, <laughs> that's what he calls it. The invention came in the wake of a new law known as the Shenzhen City Public Toilet Management Act, which allows sanitation managers and other officials to slap a $15 fine on those caught making a mess of municipal toilets while relieving themselves. The law also cracks down on anybody defacing, littering, and smoking in public privies. This guy created a, a funnel affixed to what appears to be a 10-inch piece of tube pipe. The device comes <laughs> in his or her versions. No. Hers has a shorter pipe, and it's being marketed to those who have trouble with their aim. I mean, there's always some guy coming up with. And a, he's actually selling those. Yeah, he's selling them for a dollar sixty-five a unit. Oh my god, it's not that much. He might he might be able to make a uh, to help you pee straight. <laughs> wow, it sounds like you made. It sounds like you made that just, up. Yeah, it sound, sound all these real. stories sound fake. Yeah, they sound fake, but they're all real. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't even know what to say about that one. I would say, uh, I mean, I thought it was pretty gnarly, but it's only a dollar sixty-five. I don't know if you would need a fun. I mean, you'd probably have to be pretty hammered to need a fun. <laughs> <laughs> God, I don't know. That's a weird. Uh, but this one's... No, but on that, just on that little note, a little yeah. bit. I, maybe you guys have seen it, but have you ever like went into a public, you know, restroom like that, and sometimes someone has made a mess of it, but. You know, yeah, they, they pee all over the thing, but 
I seen like shit like everywhere, like on the walls and shit. And I, think, oh, I, I think to myself, nasty. no, I think to myself, how does it get on the wall? That's you know, like I have seen that. Yeah, I've, it's I, purposeful. Yeah, people yeah are like it's doing. like it's like they're. I guess they're doing that on purpose. So That's why, nasty. I've seen yeah. that. I'm like, Ugh. fuck, man. <laughs> Yeah, I'm mean, just like, you know, it's a little bit more than the P, I know. Was but, that in this country? You know. <laughs> okay. Where was it? It was like back east somewhere, I think. Huh. Was it in this country? <laughs> <laughs> South America. Check out uh, this one. Uh, couple arrested for shacking up at Home Depot. You know those little uh, those little sheds that you buy, like tool sheds or whatever? Yeah, yeah. A South Carolina couple was arrested yesterday after... Having sex inside a display shed at a Home Depot. Emily Craig, 20, and Sean Bowden, 31, were nabbed after cops were called to the store in North Charleston around 8.40 a.m. Wow. Officers were dispatched to the business in reference to a male and female entering the display shed on the property and closing the door behind themselves and remaining inside. (laughs) So, uh... I guess when the cops rolled up, she was partially closed. The top of her dress was untied, hanging at her waist. Bowden was shirtless and had his <laughs> pants down near his knees. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that's probably not a good place to nah, I try to, I mean, especially not like during business hours. Probably not a good idea. I don't think so. <laughs> you know, some of these stories are just like, like you said, you go, is this real or is this you, like just made up? It's, is it like it's almost sound made up? Like, yeah. It's like, I'm not shocked really, really, because these days, I mean, you hear, you hear so much weird shit, but it, to really know there, some of them are real, you just think, like, what? Yeah. You know, I mean, people are people, basically, people are a trip. Man. Yeah. The sort of overarching theme of the podcast is just people are totally insane. Like mind body. The name of the new the name of my new album is called the name of the band is Pain Savior, but the name of the album is Dead Weight on a Dying Planet. (laughs) So it's that's exactly pretty much what that means is what we're talking about. Just like people that are like some of these people I mean it's like, huh? Yeah. Like and that's you know what were you thinking? Dead weight on a dying planet that the singer of course came up with that one. It's one of the lyrics in one of the songs and I'm like, it's called let's call the album that because it's so many (laughs) fucked up people. Okay. Speaking of craziness, what's the craziest thing you've seen on the road? Like, just people out of control. And this isn't that. This isn't that crazy. It's just that it's funny. This is funny to me. But a lot of people used to like to jump on. They like to jump on stage and touch Ronnie or try to grab him or like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Ah, you know. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's only crazy. But what's funny about it is to me is a couple of times Ronnie was a. A pretty, you know, short guy, right. you know, he's 5'2", he's a little guy, you know, and even even girls that would come up would be taller than him, but, you know, ba- generally speaking, but some big guys, right, come up, and um, sometimes if his uh, personal or his roadie or whatever didn't make it up there quick enough, Ronnie would, like, kick him off. I see him, like, <laughs> kick him off a couple times, and, <laughs> and we're trying to play, and I would see this, and You'd I would just be like, I'm up. cracking up, going, like, you know, it's just so... Nobody got hurt or anything. It's just, he would just kind of go through the motions with his foot, like, kind of like, he would really physically kick him, but sort of like, it's just, (laughs) it's just funny to see. see, I'm just trying to think of, I mean, crazy stuff. I mean, when I, when you ask me that, I just think of the funny, funny things that happened. Um, It's all based around the DO tours, pretty much. Um, The World War III tours were pretty cool, pretty out there. And a lot of them had to do with girls. Yeah. I don't don't know. want to go there but a lot of them had had to do with you know seeing a lot of that that shit and we, everybody knows it probably would be listening to that you know bands go on the road and then you got a tour bus and then you got groupies and then you know you can figure the rest out i mean shit that the shit that happens is like people that don't do that would probably not even believe some of that stuff that would happen you know that, right. would, that those girls would do to just get on that bus or i mean you could go on <laughs> Darren's like, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> he wants to hear it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I I don't even know. I'm I just thinking like the funny, the funny things. Um, seeing Ronnie get in a fight with the bass player once in the dressing room after the gig. I saw him got in a fight with a keyboard player once. Wow. I just to me that's kind of no, funny like too. Like a physical fight. Or? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Almost. Well. Yeah. Really yelling in the face, and then, um, well, it was broken up before it got physical. But you know, the guy had to get in between. I mean, just. 
it just wow, uh, to me heavy. it's like you know wow really it's we just got off stage you know yeah because people on the road they you know they piss you off and you get in each other's nerves we know all that yeah, and but you kind of you don't have that much of a break from them either. no just, if someone's really bugging you and, you know it would throw duct tape at the keyboard player and stuff <laughs> it's just just they're all funny stories and no, no right. one really got hurt or anything you know the thing that blew me um, away is uh, when I went to South America with you guys. Yeah, looking because I'm looking out toward the crowd, and some of those people in some of those places they look like they didn't look like a normal average fan like what you see here. People having a, like a really good time. Some of those people look like they're in the middle of a religious experience. Like it was a totally different look than I had you, ever seen. You before. totally are a thousand percent right because I noticed it too. In South America, you, you were there. Yeah. In South America, like you said, um, I noticed the whole crowd response and the and the chanting your name and waiting for you at the hotel room. It was a whole nother level of you guys were like Led Zeppelin, right. you know, than, like than in the States. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. It really was. I noticed the difference. I was like, wow. I mean, when we had finished some of those gigs and go eat Indian food afterwards, like we get in like that little bus and you, you were probably in there with us. I don't remember they were like following the bus with their little, um, either running bicycles or little like <laughs> motorcycles, <laughs> whatever they had. They were like chasing us, you know, physically, right. you know, I'm like, as far as they could keep up. Yeah. Almost like it was in a movie. Right. Yeah. Right. And I was like, wow, you know, and then at the gigs, you saw it in their face. And, um, when I would come down from the, um, in the lobby at the hotel room, they'd be saying my full name. Like I go wow, by Tracy G, but, my name's Grijalva, it's Spanish, so South America, and they'd be saying it, you know, Mr. Grijalva, Mr. Grijalva, they'd be saying it, you know, <laughs> yeah, in the yeah. Spanish thing, and they were just, your your soul runs through our, your soul runs through our street, yours and Richie Blackmore's, and they just, wow, real heavy, like, heavy, yeah. I'd be like. I remember you <laughs> admonished me one time, because I like, I opened the window to look outside, and you just hear, ah. And you're like, dude, close that window. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't act like that it over was here. Crazy. They don't no, act like that over I had here. No idea. And um, they they're behind a little bit, meaning like I think they like I don't know if you remember there was bands, some of the bands, some of the kids opening up for us like and playing like white snake covers and stuff. And that was already old then, but it was new then. They were right, acting like yeah. it was new. They were yeah. acting like, you know, me- a lot metal of band, like metal the bands was, on that tour were like uh, Bruce Dickinson, yeah, Bruce Jason Dickinson, Bonham, Bonham, yeah, Scorpions, Scorpions, yeah. But I mean, and us, and and uh, which are which are older groups, basically. But yeah, but they're fully not, into it. Oh, they were fully like treating us like the Beatles or Led Zeppelin. You remember? So yeah. I mean, was that? It, why is think, that? Because you've been all over the the world. Yeah, did you that, think that that was the strongest reaction of any place? One of them. Yeah that that one um, that was that was definitely the most um, you know. People were into it and over the top with the right. uh, chanting and uh, singing just all their the words and wanting that, autographs and wanting to yeah. touch you and wanting to you know, again act like the Beatles or the Led Zeppelin, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, the, I don't know what makes them. I don't know if it's the country or the maybe they're more hungry for it. Maybe they appreciate it Yeah, I think at that more. time it was they, they had I less bands know. coming through. Now yeah, they have more, but maybe and yeah, now it's maybe a little. That was in the nineties, you know. I, I don't know, but I, I really noticed the difference here in the states. Um, you have a whole lot of just people, you know, standing back with their arms closed, you know, just kind of check, you know, <laughs> then you have the attitude, heavy metal parking lot people, a, a, attitude, <laughs> you know, the whole New York vibe, a little bit like, you know, show, right. show us what you can do thing over there. I didn't notice any of that kind of attitude. It no, was just all none like, of but what about, and, um, did you guys ever, guys. did you guys ever go to, uh, Bulgaria when you were in the band? I don't know. I There's the craziest thing. Uh, I don't know. Actually, Don Dawkins showed me that he took a picture of it, and there's oh. a there's a statue, like a bronze statue, or or maybe it's rock or something of oh. Ronnie in this park in Bulgaria. Oh, I think I seen, seen it on see the, I seen it on the on the on the internet. It's like the craziest no, I never been, thing. I've never been there to see. He it. didn't even know it was there. He was just cruising through the park, and then all of a sudden, they, a they make they Ronnie. make the stat they made the statue of Ronnie. Like? Yeah, huge. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's like way into it. Oh, super fan. No, they're all Europe in general. Like, you know, well, you know, South America, I guess not Europe, but South America, Japan, Japan. <clears throat> Japan yeah. uh, but all Europe, you know, it's it, they 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 take in this metal stuff a lot more serious, I think, than than here. I mean, 
I don't know if that's correct to say that, but it just seems like they're just like. Yeah, it seems like uh, metal has always been kind of bigger in Europe than here. Um, yeah, especially Germany, when it was more underground, you know. I mean, Germany. I mean, when I our first tour was in Athens, Greece, with Ronnie. Acropolis is up on the hill, you know. Yeah, what, what, what's going on? What is that? You know, right. and I had never been nowhere, and I was like, but the people. I mean, it it was just always more like received. Every when I was in the band, we played Germany most. I said, so dark and freezing in the winter and cold on Tuesday, Wednesday night. Who's gonna go see? Who's gonna go out of the house? It's zero degrees. There's gonna be a line of kids around the thing, and I'm like, but that's what they're used to doing. And, and I go, well, Germany is like our biggest market over here. That's where we sell most records. I go, really? Wow. Really? I, I didn't know. You know, I'm like, wow. You know, and yeah. So they would send you. They 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 have a way of finding out where you sell the most records. I guess right. And yeah. They would say would they would they know where your markets are the best. So L.A. wasn't one of his biggest markets at all. Hmm. I mean, when I was in the band, L.A. Which you would, I would think, fuck, great, right? No, it was like I played here. I played, I played House of Blues with him and Universal Amphitheater, and uh, the that's it. On the oh. whole six years I was with him, and the closest, wow, that's crazy. The closest I got to it again was Vegas. Maybe we played, but I mean, we never played where I lived. I so mean, what, what was the big, oh, Santa what was Anna. the biggest market for Santa. you guys in uh, in the U.S. Like maybe Midwest, Midwest, or, yeah, Midwest, yeah. yeah totally. I'm like, and why, you know, again, here we go. What's the biggest market? It's, it's in the you know, Ohio and all that, whatever, you know, that right. Midwest, yeah. I'm like, uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, through Texas and all that stuff, yeah. Like, not not so much the coasts. Right. It's like in there where they don't get as much shit, maybe. They don't, I don't know, maybe they're, you know, California, New York, you know, Chicago, you know, they see and hear everything, right? But, but you know, Iowa, you know. Yeah, or maybe the they're cor- happy when anything goes. Well, maybe through, the probably. corn guys come from or something. I mean, maybe because they, they're just more sheltered from it or something. I don't know. You really notice it when you travel and you play different cultures in different countries and cult. You see the people they act they act different towards what you do. Yeah, generally it's all good. I mean, it's not like everybody. Yeah, goes but it's in, different but levels. It's yeah, different some levels of good. Some is like really, really, really strong and like whoa, and some are like, eh, you know, it's weird. I don't know if this is. Kind of a, I think it, it's been enough time where you're probably, you got some distance from it, but you were talking about on the record where some tensions started to mount a little bit. Yeah. Do you feel like people were having a reaction to, because you always, to me, had a, a really unique sound. And do you feel like people maybe were like, like they expect a certain kind of sound or style in a metal band like that, especially with Dio, you know, uh, there, yes. there's this sort of like lineage yeah. and then you come in you're like you know it's weird i don't know what you think about this but to me you always reminded me almost like a metal steve stevens because he had a lot of crazy like he's amazing noise effects and crazy he, things no, that, he's that, great. No. that i hadn't heard before in that style of music you know right, right. no I, I everything you're saying it's dead on it's like Dio, a band like any big band like Dio, say they were big in the eighties, they're already established, they sold tons of records. They have a they have a core following, they have a core fan base, they have a they've sold a lot of records to people. They're they've made it, they're successful, they could play Madison Square Gardens and sell it out. They're in. Right. And then, you know, time goes and then then they change members and they change a guitar player, which it's a guitar driven yeah, band. It's a so of the band, yeah. it's gonna have a lot of you know, change in what it does unless you get a guy who fits the mold you've already been doing, like, right, and or right. it's just a puppet or is a chameleon that can just play like anybody you want him to play. I'm none of that. Right. I'm just whatever I am, I am. Whatever it is, it is. And when I came in, I got the gig because of who I am and what I do and what I, the few things I'd done before that and how I played with Vinny and uh, <clears throat> Jimmy. And he never once said, play a solo like my ex-guitar player, play like Tony Iommi, play like Richie Blackmore, play like, he never once said that. In fact, if anything, he didn't want that. He wanted me. He said I was a combination of them all. Mm -hmm. He said, killer, great, go. And then I was taken in places where he didn't normally go. Now, that's all beautiful musically, and it's all perfect for me and for them at the time, but his fans are going to be like, they're not all going to be accepting of that. So I got the backlash of, of, I got a lot of a lot of new fans over that. I did. I do still. A lot of people say that's their favorite shit ever. But wow. then a lot of them are like, "Fuck you," like, <laughs> like fuck what 
you you sucked. You know, you can't play like there are the guitar players. You just make a bunch of noise. You ruin, you know, you ruin all the old geo stuff, anything to do, you know. And that's accept and that's that's you're gonna have that, you know. And I'm I'm cool with it all because I know I'm just being myself. So But you know, it seemed like live you uh you did try to stay pretty true to the original like I mean when you have a staple like Holy Diver, you can't really Start getting all you know yeah, I mean, experimental I, weird I, on you it. You mean like mostly like some of the chords I would change a little bit, but most most of the rhythm. When you're right, doing the solos and stuff, it's pretty when pretty I'm, close. When right? I'm doing I mean, the solos, the, to the, me the spirit of it. To me, it was to me it was I would take the original, which was Vivian Campbell, and I would learn like I think you do or any guitar player, anybody who plays would probably do that. If you got to you learn a cover or something, and it comes to the solo. You take um, the, the skeleton, riff, the, right. the skeleton or the signature parts that pop out and that are rememberable to you, right? And you have those, and then everything in between, you do what you do, you do whatever you do. It's a lot of it's improv, a lot of it's improvising. But um, again, on my behalf, that's how I learned. And when I went to see Jeff Beck or uh, Jimmy Page or Richie Blackmore, Tony Iommi or Ted Nugent or anybody I grew up on, they none of them played the solos. None of them played their own solos the way they went. They all were improvising, oh, yeah, totally. and that's how yeah. I play. So right. that's how I play because that's what I learned. I don't ever play the same solo night for night, exactly the same thing. I would be bored out of my mind. That's not even me feeling the music. That's just playing, and this is just a signature part that you do that, you know, it's like a, almost like a vocal part. But most, let's face it, most Dio guitar players before me, as far as I'm concerned, they had very little signature parts. I mean, like, they're not like me trying to copy like a Beck solo or something. Right. They're like improvising 90% of the time. That's what it sounds right, like right. to me. Yeah, and then I got a couple so. parts that go, I mean, so I'm just only copying the ones that stick out to me that, you know, and then the rest I would improvise and play did, for did the given night. Did you ever meet night. any of the older uh, guys? Like, did you ever meet Viv? I met, or Vivian, I met Vivian one time at a World War Three gig. He was there with Jimmy and Vinny hanging out with him. I met him oh, So it once. wasn't, you weren't in the band yet? I was in the band. I was in World War Three. yeah. But you weren't in uh, Dio yet? No. Oh, okay. While I was in Dio, did I meet any of them? Yeah. Me? Only Ro- Rowan. Been... Only Rowan. Only Rowan. Yeah. Rowan. Yeah, the younger guy. Really cool. Nice yeah, guy. Cool guy yeah. Real cool guy. I met him, but I never, I met, I met Craig at, Jeff Pilson's house when Jeff Pilson got married. I mm-hmm. met Craig for just it was just high, but right. I never spoke with him and had a conversation with uh, him or much with Vivian or um, Rowan was the only other guy. And then after me, there was uh, Doug, I think, and I never yeah, met Doug's, him either. Yeah, he's in. Is he, I think he's in White Sink now or something. Yeah, yeah, I think so. He does a few things. Yeah. So I mean, what were uh, did I answer I, that question? I mean, yeah, did, yeah, you did. But I, I was wondering. Uh, oh, you said something about tension. 